Two and a Half Admins, episode 54. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. And before we get started, your customary blog post plug is History of ZFS Part 3. Yep. Well, link in the show notes as usual. <laughs> Let's do some news then. The first one is that both Samsung and Western Digital have been caught out swapping parts in SSDs and not telling anyone about it. On the face of it, the Western Digital one seems like the worst of the two because uh, you know the the problem there was identified. They snuck QLC into a drive that had been TLC prior to that. So you know, not only is it going to be lower performance, which oddly is all most of the outlets seem to be talking about, those drives will also be much lower write endurance. They won't last for as long before they uh, get worn out. With Samsung, it, it's a little bit stranger of a story. Samsung has been having trouble keeping its controller plants operational this year, and it ended up changing the controller in the 970 Evo Plus SSD. Now, the funny thing is they changed it to what should, in theory, be a higher performance controller, the one that they use in their 980 Pro line. But the performance of the drive, once you exhaust the SLC cache at the front of it, just absolutely tanked, you know, to like half of what it should have been. So it's hard to say whether that's a problem in tuning the controller for, you know, a different drive and a different workload than it originally had been tuned for, or if there may be something else regarding the actual flash that we just don't know about. I'm not sure. Well, I thought I read somewhere that they also switched from, it was still TLC, but they switched from 96 layer to 128 layer flash. Ah, well, that might explain it then. Yeah. So at least it was still TLC, not going to QLC. But again, you know, if you're going to fundamentally change what the device is, how about a different model number so that people could tell the difference? You know, the, the thing you really want to avoid in the end is people playing a lottery of buying the part and maybe they get the good version and maybe they don't. As the manufacturer, you probably don't want that, although I can understand why you want to just sell as many as you can or whatever. And I understand the operational exigencies that mean, you know, you can't always continue to get exactly the same part all the time. But if you fundamentally change what the device is, it needs a new model number. Well, that's exactly what Samsung has said they will do in the future. And I think Western Digital did as well, although they were very specific to say on SSDs and some other qualifier about it as well, not just everything they make. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. That's not quite fair. Right. I suppose you can't just make a blanket promise that will always rev the version number or whatever. But Well, what I started to say is, you know, none of the storage manufacturers are just unequivocally saying, okay, we're gonna be we're gonna come down on the, you know, the good side on this. It it's always weasel words, but I actually have to go back on my words on that a little bit because uh, Seagate, at least once in recent history, did exactly that. You know, when they said, look, SMR is not appropriate for our NAS drives, period. We're never going to put it in our NAS drives, period. You know, no weasel words or slightly separate, like put a plus on the end of the brand name. Just no, Iron Wolf means no SMR. So we do at least have one vendor who unequivocally did the right thing once. But it's kind of hard to come up with, you know, example number two. Yeah, well, because, you know, looking at the swapping out flash for not as good flash after the unit has been reviewed and, and everyone is buying it based on those reviews and so on, because it wasn't just Western Digital and Samsung, it was A Data and... Crucial. Yeah. Almost everybody that makes SSDs at some point is going to try to get away with selling <laughs> you cheaper flash. And it, you know, brings me back to the memories of seeing those images on Reddit or whatever, where somebody had uh, taken an external hard drive enclosure and replaced it with like a, a pen drive, a little USB flash stick and like a, a giant heavy mechanical bolt to make the hard drive heavy enough that people right. wouldn't realize. <laughs> and, you know, it would claim to be four terabytes, but it only had 256 meg or gigs of actual storage inside of it. And it would just overwrite itself and stuff. It's not quite that bad, but it's just, that's the picture that pops into my head immediately when you hear the story of, yeah, we just swapped out your TLC NAND for some QLC NAND, which will be slower and wear out faster. And, you know, the caching layer in front of it will hide that fact from most people uh, and we'll probably get away with it. That whole, you know, we'll swap out your TLC for QLC. It just, it's got a definite feeling of like waking up in a hotel bathtub packed full of ice, you know? <laughs> But how did they think they were going to get away with this? That's what I don't understand. Like in the world where we're all connected and everyone's got a YouTube channel and a Twitter account and everything, surely they knew they'd get busted. That's not the question, though. The question is not, you know, how did they think they were never going to get caught? The question is, 
why does it look like it's not going to matter? Imagine the outrage if people were going out and buying Mustang GTs and getting home from the dealership and realizing there's a four-cylinder under the hood, right? Instead of the V8. Like, imagine that level of outrage. But when manufacturers pull some crap that is exactly like that, you know, with this stuff, it just, it's, you know, flash drives and SSDs instead of cars, but it's still, you're literally just not getting the thing that you paid for. And it had the branding on it, you know? Like, you weren't mistaken. You bought the thing that always meant you get the V8. But then it's like, wait a minute, is this pedals in this thing? (laughs) But consumers just take it. There's plenty of angry people to show up on forums or whatever. But, you know, as far as what actually happens, you know, Best Buy doesn't take Western digital products off their shelves. You know, consumers don't get at the Best Buy, like, protesting and demanding that they, you know, remove those from the shelves. Certainly Congress isn't stepping in to do something about it. So you would think like in the EU, some one of their consumer protection laws would actually protect them from this. What I would almost say is a textbook definition of bait and switch. I'm afraid I wouldn't know about that anymore, Alan. Yeah. Our EU protection is also sadly lacking, Joe. It's not just you. Yeah. (laughs) Western Digital has come out and said that they will accept RMAs on people who bought the 550 blue or whatever and got the QLC version and it's not good enough for their use case. But yeah, I don't know how many people are are actually going to manage to take advantage of that or what hoops Western Digital would make you jump through to to do it. Well, if it's anything like uh, when they put SMR in the NAS drives, a lot of people were successful in RMAing those. Um, Even before Western Digital made it like a known policy, they definitely had an internal policy not to get in the way of those kind of RMAs. Because I told a lot of people, like, you know, look, that's what you need to do. You need to reach their support. You tell them, you know, this is not the drive that I was supposed to get and I need to return it and let me know if that does not work. But nobody ever said, you know, hey, I tried to RMA this and I couldn't. And a lot of people said, oh, yeah, they they took it right back. And, you know, they they shipped me a non-SMR drive, you know, like I was supposed to get in return. Well, Western Digital have somewhat distracted from this with their 20 terabyte spinning Rust drive that also has NAND on it. When the West Digital reps first reached out to me about that, I was like, oh, great. You know, the world's biggest of those stupid little SSHDs from like, you know, 2011, 2012 were everywhere. Where I was like, oh, it'll be fast like an SSD, but big like a hard drive. And turns out it was just a hard drive. Like you literally could not tell the difference. This isn't that. So there is NAND on the new 20 terabyte hard drive, but it's not actually there for customer data. It's there for uh, what they call repeatable run-on data, which is basically, um, that's metadata that is accessible to the drive's firmware. It's not exposed outside the drive itself. And uh, basically what it is is information on how to compensate for microscopic wobbles in, you know, the revolutions of the platters themselves. So prior to this OptiNAND architecture, that metadata is interleaved between the firmware accessible tracks on the drives themselves. And that takes up a significant amount of room, which limits your, you know, overall aerial density because you get lower tracks per inch. By getting that data off of the platters and putting it onto NAND, they solve the latency problems of accessing it in a couple of ways. For one thing, the heads don't have to seek at all. And for another, you don't end up having to store the data in a lot of different redundant places to minimize the head seeking because you always get your low latency return because it's coming off a of NAND, not coming off of rotational media. Yeah. I wonder, does the metadata also include things like the relocated sectors, just like the map of where else on the platter? To, and because before when that was in the host protected area. Yes, but I think the RRO was the majority right. of the the issue. Like, I mean, I, the a bad sector map is going to take up, you know, 0.00001%, you know, of a 20 terabyte drive, maybe. And I guess they just pin that into the, the read cache anyway, so that it's not actually having to go and read that off the disk in order to tell if, hey, the section you're reading, is that remapped or whatever? But yeah, that would just be in the read cache. Yeah, but the, the RRO is individual per track, from what I understand. And there's just quite a bit more of it. Yep. So the other thing that this OptiNAND cache can do, um, although... Western Digital is like real particular about making sure everybody knows, looks, this is not, you know, a hybrid drive. Customer data does not go into this OptiNAND. Well, in one circumstance, it does. 
the drives have their own ability to, uh, you know, kind of like a, a caching RAID controller, you know, battery backed RAID controller will accept writes that it says is committed to disk, but, you know, it's completely lying because it's just relying on the, uh, you know, the battery or the super cap behind its cache to allow it to write that out the next time the system boots. So on these new Optinan drives, they have, it's not a super cap or a battery. They actually rely on the disk itself acting as a flywheel to keep a capacitor charge for long enough. But what they can do is if they detect a power off on the drive when they've still got dirty data in cache that was supposed to be written to the drive synchronously, then it can just flush that data temporarily to the NAND, up to 100 megabytes of it. And then the next time the drive has real power, it, you know, it works kind of like a ZFS log device. Uh, if it finds dirty data in the NAND when it powers on, then it goes ahead and commits that dirty data and you know, then you're good. So by doing this, the drive is able to uh, you know, do just what battery backed RAID controllers do and basically lie to the operating system. The minute it accepts the data from you, it just goes ahead and says, yep, that's synced, we're good because it knows it can flush it to NAND if it needs to. Yeah, so getting the, the commit time or the F-sync time uh, on a spinning disk down is, is a pretty big win. It's interesting that you said that it's only about 100 megabytes or so of it, whereas I assume the DRAM cache or whatever that's on the, the disk is 256 megs based on the fact that it's 20 terabytes. They didn't go into a lot of detail about that. Um, we do know that it's willing to accept up to 100 megabytes of, uh, you know, dirty... To be clear, that's dirty sync data. So I would imagine that there's a lower limit on how many sync writes, you know, the drive will accept into cache before it says, okay, I need to commit some of this to leave some room for, you know, non-sync writes. I don't know. That does go to answering my question of, you know, about how much flash are they actually using? And I'm guessing it's not that much if they're trying to store all this metadata, but they they only have enough to back up, say, 100 megabytes of, of the write cache that, you know, obviously it's not many gigabytes of of flashes they're actually putting in it. It's just a small amount for that metadata to speed up the disk and to, like you said, free up space on the platter to let them get that bit more density in there and make sure they can get to 20 terabytes and beyond because I think they want to get to, what was it, 50 terabytes by 2025? Not by 2025. They expect 50 terabyte disks in the second half of this decade. So 2025 to 2029. And yeah, I, I think by far the most important feature of the Optinand was getting the RRO data off disk, because basically what that allowed them to do, this is not Western Digital's first 20 terabyte disk. Um, I think they are still the only major manufacturer with a 20 terabyte drive. Seagate had been promising one, but at least as of last year, it still hadn't become generally available. Yeah, that's the other thing. When, when they do make these new bigger drives, they're basically selling them exclusively to large cloud providers and trying them out there for a while before they make them generally available. Regardless, the 18 and 20 terabyte drives last year were all SMR. And uh, if we haven't made it clear enough yet, there is no SMR involved in these new Optinand drives. You know, it's it's full-on perpendicular magnetic recording at 20 terabytes in one nine-platter drive that, you know, fits in a standard full-size drive bay. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash 25A and see why Linode has been voted the top infrastructure as a service provider by both G2 and Trustradius. From their award-winning support offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. Linode offers great price-to-performance value for all compute instances, including GPUs, as well as block storage, Kubernetes, and their upcoming bare metal release. Linode makes cloud computing fast, simple, and affordable, allowing you to focus on your projects, not your infrastructure. So go to linode.com 25A Create a free account with your Google or GitHub account or your email address and you'll get $100 in credit. That's linode.com slash 25A. Alan, you found an article about landlines and how they're going to be changing in the UK over the next few years. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I watched my parents go through the transition recently to, to having VoIP instead of the landline. And then seeing in the UK that, I think it was, again, by 2025, their plan was to not have any plain old telephone system lines anymore and transition everything to VoIP. But in proposing that, they've run into some interesting conundrums that happen because of how different the old telephone system works. I mean, the biggest one being that 
the plain telephone system actually sends power through the telephone lines. So I think in the US and, and Canada, it's 24 volts, is it? Do you know, Jim, off the top of your head? I thought it was 30, but... Something to that effect. It's somewhere in that general ballpark. So there's a bunch of voltage that comes on down the line as well, and that meant that you could still make a telephone call when the power was out. In general, obviously not the case with uh, voice over IP, although if you have a battery backup, then you know that can stay on for a while. Because I remember seeing when my parents got it, that you know, it came with this battery backup unit that would keep the cable modem and the, the phone working long enough. I think it had to run for 36 hours while the power was out in standby or whatever, and be able to do up to one hour of phone calls with no electricity. So being able to make calls with the power out was really more of a bonus, though. The real reason that there's that much voltage on the line was to ring literal mechanical bells electromagnetically, you know, in the early yes. days. <laughs> there's a great technology connections video on YouTube of, you know, how it actually <laughs> rang the bell and so on. But that same kind of feature or side effect of phone lines has been used in other systems. Uh, for example, in the UK, there are something like 4,600 sets of traffic lights that actually rely on the power from the phone system in order to do remote management, but also to keep the traffic lights working even if the power is out. Oh, that is some sloppy small business type stuff right there. Ah, oh, just reuse this one thing for that other thing. It'll be fine. <laughs> Yep, until that thing goes away suddenly. And it's like, all right, A, how are we going to manage these traffic lights? And B, oh, there we don't have a backup power supply anymore. Because I remember seeing some of the old uh, public phone booths in the UK being converted to have the um, defibrillator kits in them. And they're like, yeah, when they removed the phone service, they, they took the power away. And now we need to actually get power installed to this phone booth in order to recharge the battery on this thing. Yeah, when I started reading this, I thought, well, it's no big deal. But then you realize that it's used for so many things, this system. The list on the BBC article we'll link to says home burglar alarms and security systems, traffic lights, cash machines, ATMs, you call them, railway signals, motorway signs. I'm going to call this now. No way is this happening in the next four years. They're not going to be able to turn it off completely. In the US, how many times did the transition away from analog TV get delayed? <laughs> And that was just television. I don't know. But the weird thing is, I, I think we're already done in the majority of the United States, you know, with the VoIP conversions. Like you can't get a 1FB or a 1FR, you know, the, the old school copper pots line. You, you can't get those anymore. There's nobody that will sell them to you. That actually came up at my house three or four years ago because uh, my wife decided that she wanted to get a landline because she wanted the kids to be able to call her. But, you know, she didn't want it to be a device that could get lost or play games with or exhaust the battery or whatever. So she's like, well, I'm just going to go down to Walmart and get a regular old school phone. And then I will call AT&T or Bell South or whoever and get a regular old phone line. And that'll be that. And she calls up AT&T and AT&T says, well, we can't give you that. We can sell you Internet. You want Internet? <laughs> And we'll give you a phone line if you get internet. And she's like, but we have internet. That's kind of where that ended because, you know, our most of the United States has a duopoly. You've got one cable provider and you've got one DSL provider. And that's the way it is in my market. We got Spectrum for the coax and we got AT&T for the DSL. And so what my wife didn't realize is what that really meant is, well, it is only with internet access anymore. So you call Spectrum, who is your current internet provider, and say, hey, we want VoIP and, you know, then they ship you a new modem and you plug it in and everything's fine. But it was interesting just seeing a normal human being just being like, what? Because you go to get a phone line and they tell you you can't have one. You know, it's like finding out you can't get power delivered to your house. <laughs> Interestingly, I actually just saw a different article related uh, of some guy in the UK who couldn't get power delivered to his house. <laughs> he was too rural and nobody would bother to set up a meter for him because he lives in an area so rural that the new smart meters that chain the Wi-Fi off of each other wouldn't reach him. <laughs> and so <laughs> nobody wants to sell him a power meter anymore. Uh, so I guess that's kind of the same problem. Honestly, now that you mentioned it, I don't know if I could still manage to get a, a POTS line at my house or not. I kind of want to call Bell and be like, yes, hook one up so I can cancel it immediately. <laughs> well, I unplugged my landline recently because I tried changing the phone number twice and it just it was just constant getting these spammers phoning me. And in the end, I just said, that's it, we're unplugging it. We're not having a landline anymore. And I, I need to phone up and renegotiate my deal because it comes with my internet. So I'm, I'm done with having a landline. I think uh, it's time. 
Yeah, but it's just interesting how many different things piggyback on that and and just what some of the implications are. Because even beyond that, you have the concept like if your ISP needs to do maintenance or something and your your internet's going to be down for an hour, you know, they try to avoid that. But if that happens, that's probably not something they're going to get in a lot of trouble about. Whereas the phone system, you know, when it's down, because it's a regulated utility, if it's down, you know, that causes a, a big deal and they have a you know, a much harder push for, you know, the phone has to just always work. You can't pick it up and it'd be dead. Well, the internet doesn't have that same level of regulation. And suddenly, if all telephone is via the internet, then, you know, it doesn't have the same guarantees that the the old copper lines did. Wouldn't it be amazing if internet access were regulated that way? Oh, yes. Yes, it would. Like people's heads started rolling if it was still down a few minutes later and nobody had done anything or talked to anybody or notified customers or anything. You could have a sort of a federal, I don't know, federal communications commission, maybe? Like may, maybe that would be the kind of agency that you'd need to, you know, regulate your communications medium. Nah, that'll never work. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CBT Nuggets. Training for IT professionals or anyone looking to build IT skills. Go to cbtnuggets.com slash 25admins and sign up for a seven-day free trial. The on-demand virtual labs mean you can build practical experience with the commands, config, scripts, and everything you need to get the most out of each course. Another standout feature is the accountability coaching service, available to all learners with a subscription, which gives you access to a real person who will help you craft a personalized learning plan and set goals, and will check in with you to keep you accountable. So start your free seven-day trial today at cbtnuggets.com slash 25admins. It includes unlimited access to all course materials, including virtual labs. That's cbtnuggets.com slash 25admins. Let's do some free consulting then. But first, just a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to 2.5admins.com slash support. And remember, for $5 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. And if you want to send any questions or feedback, show at 2.5admins.com. So Justin writes to us, On an earlier episode, you discussed the requisite fluency and general setup for managing collections of servers. Going beyond what you said then, what is your specific strategy? From what I can glean, Jim isolates each server to a QEMU VM on its own ZFS dataset. When do you choose VMs over, say, LexD? Is your monitoring from within the VMs? And Alan, is it Beehive or Jails? You're exactly right. Every server gets its own KVM virtual machine. So uh, yeah, QMU, KVM. I don't really do anything important in containers because I don't need incredible density of individual instances and uh, containers just don't provide as much isolation as VMs do. So it hasn't been a worthwhile trade-off for me to mess with the containers. As far as monitoring goes, uh, my monitoring is all via Nagios, and uh, Nagios is its own thing, and all the machines are their individual things. They run the NERPY client that the uh, Nagios machine reaches out to for the monitoring, but, I mean, it's basically the monitoring server reaches out and gathers data from them, if that answers your question. Yeah, for me, it depends on the use case. For the video streaming and so on, we have real hardware machines that have basically nothing on the host OS. It's just a management platform. And then we use a jail for each different role. So there's, you know, a video streaming edge server or an origin server or a camera slurping server or a database server or, you know, the servers that execute the stuff for our control plane or the control panel that our customers use and so on. And so we use jails uh, for each different role. And then basically Puppet runs on the host and decides, you know, looks at a manifest and says, these four roles need to be set up on the server and, and builds them and sets it up. And then for monitoring, we use Nagios as well. That runs in a different jail on a different server. And we do a mix. About half of our checks with Nagios are active, meaning Nagios goes out to the server and checks something. Like, you know, can I pull a video stream from the video server? Or, you know, does it answer correctly on this port with this query or whatever? And then the other half is passive, where the servers will send data back to Nagios being like, you know, here's a giant blob of metrics data on like how busy the disks are and stuff. And we use those to make nice graphs in Nagios and be able to 
do trending and alert say, all right, you know, the average latency on the disk on that machine is going up. You might want to look at it. Or the smart data says that, you know, we're relocating sectors on that disk. It's probably time to order the replacement and things like that. I do use some Beehive VMs, although that's mostly for development stuff, uh, which happens in my home lab. You know, when I'm working on software or whatever, I do it in a VM because it's just faster to be able to do a NFS rooted VM means I can, you know, FreeBSD make install world to a subdirectory and reboot the VM and it, it loads it up and it's a lot faster than copying back and forth into the VM. Okay, Jordan says, I have a ZFS array in a desktop computer with limited space. I have backups, but I also want snapshots for the convenience of being able to restore quickly from local storage. Since the space I have available in my computer is limited, what options are there for keeping snapshots on other hard drives? I have a USB hard drive that I leave plugged in all the time. What would it look like to use ZFS Send with that? I know how to set up a NAS in my house, but I don't have the budget for that. What other cheap and simple options are there? Well, so I don't know how big your array is. I think there may be some misconception of how you store snapshots on other machines, typically. You can always send a binary of a snapshot that basically is like streaming a tarball to tape. That's not usually what people really want to do. And regardless, you need to have, you know, a full to base that from. So if you can't fit that on your array, I don't think you're going to be able to fit it on an external drive either. Uh, if you had a larger NAS, you would have the option of doing something like, you know, scheduling the maintenance of, say, you know, just two dailies at a time on your host machine and replicating those off to the larger NAS that just kept them around for longer. Maybe it would have a policy to keep 30 dailies or maybe even 60 or 90 instead of just two. That's what that usually looks like, but I just don't know that there's going to be a great answer for what you really want to do, which is just keep snapshots on an external drive. Unless Alan can think of something I can't. Yeah, like the generally the limitation is going to be in order to do an incremental send to go from the last snapshot to the next snapshot, both sides need to have a snapshot in common. So that means you have to keep at least a couple of snapshots on the live system. And then if you're going to keep more snapshots on the backup, it needs more space than the primary. And if your backup is for your array is a single external hard drive is probably not bigger than your whole array. If it is, then yeah, you can set up ZFS replication and do that, but the snapshots are only useful as basically being the difference between the last full or a full and what's in the snapshot. And so storing them individually really, like Jim said, you can store them as a binary, but then they're only usable to restore from the point the snapshot starts from to the point the snapshot was taken. And if you've lost your array, then you don't have a starting point. And so you need the full thing. And so it needs more space. Basically, your backup's always going to be bigger than the original thing. And so you need that much space to do a backup. I think part of the confusion might be that, uh, you know, somebody who sees an incremental ZFS send might think, okay, well, you know, I could just store that snapshot. That's not that much data. And what you don't realize is you're not actually looking at the snapshot. You're looking at a very specific incremental send that assumes that you have the before side of that snapshot in full already present. And so the little thing that you're seeing and thinking of as a snapshot that you send, what that really is, is just a patch for the full that you absolutely have to have had from before it. So that's why you can't just save a snapshot off to a drive because that's not a thing. And before you start trying to think of clever ways to do it in the other direction and go backwards, uh, you can't build snapshots backwards with ZFS either. They go forward only. So you need to have a full prior to the snapshot patch set that you know, you've saved out of this ZFS send stream. So it's just not going to be that useful for just about anything other than like, you know, if you've literally got LTO tapes you want to store data on or something. But say you had a ZFS pool that was six terabytes, but then you bought yourself an external 10 terabyte drive. You could send the initial snapshot to that drive and be fine, right? Because it's bigger. Yeah. Right. But you have to keep a snapshot in common between the two drives. But in Joe's case, that would be fine because the 10 terabyte drive is larger than the six terabyte array. Yeah. Right. Well, we'd better get out of here then. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Ressington. I'm at JRSSNet. And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next week.